today. It's a wonderful opportunity to uh, talk with Dr. Gavin Eschenen. Warm welcome. It's Thank also you, St. Willebrot's uh, Day, which unites yes. uh, the Netherlands and the UK. In the seventh century, Willebrot, the apostle of the Frisians, uh, dying in Echternach in Germany, uh, in those days anyway, present day Luxembourg. Also founding the Archbishop Rick of uh, Utrecht, a great blessing to Christianity in these regions. Today is different. And also the person of Willebrot brings us to the current crisis, both in Catholicism and Protestantism. He died in Echternach. Today, Bishop Hollerich, Cardinal Hollerich, is uh, Archbishop in Luxembourg with very different views on morality, different views on scripture than Willebrot. Today's reading in the uh, old lectionary was from, uh, in the Old Testament, is, was from Isaiah 21. How has Jerusalem, the faithful city, become like an harlot? It used to be so full of righteousness and judgment. So Willebrot and today's lectionary uh, help us into the heart of today's uh, crisis. A lot of people don't, uh, don't see that. As far as the Roman Catholic Church is concerned, they would uh, refer to some informal remarks of Pope Francis the other day that he informally reconfirmed the church's stance on uh, uh, women's ordination in line with uh, scripture, that it doesn't happen. So uh, there's no need for concern, is there? Or is there still a crisis thinking of, for instance, uh, Bishop Hollery and so many others with similar views? Was that a question to me, Bindo? That was a question to you. Is there a crisis? Yes, there's a crisis of the most enormous proportions. One of the mm -hmm. most serious crises, uh, certainly perhaps since the Aryan controversy, which uh, people have been comparing it to. Uh, the crisis is multi-layered, um, and I think one has to decide whether one's going to talk about it intellectually, theologically, culturally, historically, or, or spiritually. Um, one has to choose one's language to decide yes. which one is. I mean, clearly we need all of those, but it's probably important if you're having a conversation to decide which of those is the currency of the conversation. Let's let's start with the spiritual one first. I received a question the other day. Uh, yes, we're hearing about the crisis this and crisis that, and the next terrible thing that some bishop has said or done. Uh, but if we look at the spiritual it will help us to, to be anchored in, in God's revelation and then we can take it further intellectually so that people understand because once you understand, uh, it's it's easier to stick with the truth. But do to take the spiritual angle first, please, because that's... Let, let, me, let, me, let, let me refer to the Gospel of John and, and look at the um, night before our Lord's death. Um, I think there are two facets there that strike me as informing us about what we're facing at the moment. First is he he talked about the prince of this world and he talks about the influence that Satan had, but not to be afraid because he's over, he'd overcome the prince of this world. However, the history, the history of the church is the prince of this world does a great deal of damage to our Lord. He had him killed, though our Lord rose from the dead and then uh, undermined the whole uh, tenor and agenda of evil by, um, by, by the use of redemptive love rather than coercive, seductive power. Uh, and uh, Christians have followed that way, but we know that we have always been struggling against an enemy. At our baptism, we turn to Christ, we repent of our sins, and we renounce the devil. Um, the problem is that, that in the West, a sense of the reality of evil has been missing, uh, partly because it's been replaced by uh, the language of psychotherapy, 
partly because rationalism can't conceive of a metaphysical reality it has no no scale to gauge um but we are constantly facing an, an evil which perverts us and perverts the church the other thing that happened that that night was 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 judas the great difficulty that the church faces and for the moment i'm i'm talking about the catholic church but but let me talk it in, in both senses the church universal as well as the roman catholic church is is a trick we haven't found before faced before which is that judas has slipped into the seat of saint peter and this is very difficult because uh, uh, when jesus said upon this rock i will build my church he was referring to peter uh, Protestants, of course, think it's a statement of Petrine faith, but let's leave that argument aside for the moment. It isn't germane to what we're talking about. Uh, upon, upon this rock, I build my, my church. And, and, the, and, and Judas has managed to replace himself with the Petrine, with Peter and the Petrine faith. This makes life impossible for Catholics because we can't, we can't change the, the, the structure of revelation. Uh, and, and it's almost as if, for example, a parasite has got into the control room. Uh, you can't blow up the control room to get rid of the parasites. That that would be seriously counterproductive. So what what do you do if a parasite is is eating away a brain and destroying the nervous system? Um, and and that's the dilemma that the church is facing. So we face a, cri a spiritual crisis of enormous proportions. We face the fact that that uh, evil has deceived so many people by presenting itself as good in terms of the sexual revolution in terms of therapeutic and political solutions. But perhaps for, for Catholics, the most critical thing is that, that evil is masquerading as Peter. And, and one, understanding how to manage that is immensely problematic. And that's the crisis we face ourselves in, in, the, in the middle of at the moment. As you uh, mentioned the sea of uh, Peter or uh, Rome, if we um, make this more concrete, um, what are the evils you are uh, talking about? Well, during the last half of, from the 1950s onwards, um, Christian theology suffered a, a number of sorts, but, but two in particular. The first one, I suppose, came from German theology which and scholarship, which suggested that the Gospels couldn't be relied upon. Um, and I, actually, particularly in the last 30 years, theology has swung the other way, as it always does. Uh, and we've discovered that the, so far from the Gospels being the product of Chinese whispers, um, the apostolic connection between the Gospel writers and Jesus it's really very close. If you com if you compare the best scenario, which is indeed perfectly possible, they were all written. One scholar suggests everything was written before AD seventy, on the grounds that there are a number of editorial interpolations in the texts when people can't understand something, and the the editor of the gospel can't can't bear not to write something in. Um, talking about uh, um, well, anyway. The, so the, the the argument is um, that. The fall of Jerusalem was so important and Jesus' prophecies about it were so critical to everything that was to happen that it would be impossible when he said not one stone will be left upon another for an editor not to say and, and, and look what's happened. And therefore there's, uh, this, this argument was produced initially in the English speaking world by, by Bishop John Robinson, an Anglican bishop who was a, a very bad theologian and wrote a terrible book called honest to God, which destroyed a whole generation's faith. But he was quite a good biblical scholar. And uh, and and paradoxically Priority of John. Yes. And it was his but it was his view that that the Gospels had almost certainly all been been committed to papyrus by the year AD 70. Even even if they hadn't, we still have extraordinary links between uh someone like Polycarp, who was alive in 160, who learned his Christianity from John and so for by the year 150, if the church wanted to know what Jesus meant by the Eucharist or the Mass, it just they just had to ask Polycarp, who would say, John said Jesus meant this. So the early development of the church was profoundly rooted in apostolic witness and understanding, uh, much more than the, um, than the progressive intellectual theological studies of, of, of German rationalism. Uh, showed so the, the, that was that deprived people of confidence in the scriptures. The difficulty is that, that something more insidious or equally insidious took place, which is 
I, I would say the growth of of, uh, of Jungian therapy. So for a while, I was a, a, a great uh, um, admirer of Carl Gustav Jung, partly because when I was working in a university, he was a very helpful antidote to, 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 to Sigmund Freud. Uh, early Freud is disastrous, late Freud gets a bit better. Um, but in the time, certainly up until the middle of the 1990s, um, most people had a had a, um, had had f their instincts defined by what they thought Freud taught. And Carl Gustav Jung was enormously helpful because he suggested that the human task uh, in dealing with religion meant that religion was not a neurosis and not something that had to be rejected. As, as leftish materialism had always suggested, but actually was an essential tool of human integration and, and human becoming. The, and that, that's true. The difficulty is that for him, whenever he spoke about God, his notion of God was, well, was the developing human self. A form yes, of the archetypes. Right. And the and, archetypes and, were helpful too, because you can explain that Christianity is influential, so to non-believers, but... Uh... There's an enormous amount that's helpful in, in Jung, yeah. um, but it's undermined by two very critical flaws. One is that he rejects metaphysical evil and replaces it with a shadow, which is about the integration of evil uh, within the, rather than the rejection of it. Uh, and the other thing he does is to, to suggest that everything is about the notion of the self. The God, God becomes, with a small g, becomes self with a capital S. And these two ideas, the integration of polarities and opposites, as opposed to the rejection of evil and the narcissistic uh, pursuit of the self have crippled society for the last 50 years. And the difficulty is that, that, that as always, Christians either have to convert the society around us or be converted by it. And what's happened uh, is that partly through a lack of confidence in the scriptures, which was where we came into the conversation, partly through spiritual deception, uh, but particularly through ideological attraction. Christians have bought into the Jungian idea, and the Jungian idea in particular is very favorable to um, the tenets of feminism and uh, and self-same attracted people uh, as well. Um, and, and the problem is that, that the... Um, the political thought crimes of racism, feminism, and the promotion of homosexuality are all serious ideological difficulties for Christianity. If Christianity takes them on board, it becomes a different kind of philosophy, a different religion. Uh, but it hasn't. But it has to find the reasons to reject them. Uh, and the, the crisis at the moment is that certainly the people at the top of the Catholic Church uh, and liberal Protestantism has suffered from exactly the same fate have bought into the Jungian ideas and dropped, if you like, the, the, the polarities and the dualities that the gospel teaches about in favor of a therapeutic model, which, uh, un, uh, which simply destroys the faith. It, uh, it, it turns it essentially into group therapy instead of salvation. So at the moment, those who are in charge of the church are offering uh, a rather inept form of group. It's not even therapy that works. People don't, I mean, <laughs> there are lots of studies about the effectiveness of therapy, both individually and in groups, and on the whole, it's a kind of 50-50 thing. <laughs> it's not, therapy is not very effective, but the kind of therapy that the, the, the Christianity has adopted is even less effective. And it's, it's, it's doubly tragic that not only should have adopted something that destroys the faith, but something that doesn't even work. Yes, and 30 years after the rest has uh, rushed ahead. Yeah. Uh, we're really in the midst of the uh, intellectual background and reasons or, or, or already. If we broaden this a little bit, as you were talking, I was also thinking about some of the royal uh, families in uh, Europe, a distant relative of ours in South Africa. Uh, Lawrence Enderpost was a strong Jungian with a tremendous influence on the present King of England. If uh, Lawrence Lawrence van der Post is single-handedly responsible for the heterodoxy of, of King Charles uh, and the undermining of the of the meaning of the coronation in our country. Charles Charles uh, Charles intended his vows to be understood in a Jungian way, partly through the influence of van der Post, and therefore. Uh, whereas the defender of the faith might well have come to the rescue of beleaguered Christians in the body politic and seen that as his job, since that's what the oath swore. 
he's interpreted it in a Jungian way under under Lawrence's influence, and and therefore um, has dropped the idea of the faith to the Jungian notion of faith itself, religious religious not religiosity, which of course uh, is first of all a nonsensical term that can't be defended; it, it, it's impossible to define. But secondly, works against Christianity. Christianity says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You have to choose between different forms of revelation, different forms of reality. Uh, the religiosity that both Jung and, and Charles adopt contradict that and undermine it. Profound, I mean, they're totally antithetic to it. And so in spiritual terms, we have antichrist versus Christ, uh, to put it at its bluntest. And that's really yeah. a very serious problem. And Lawrence van der Post has a lot to answer for. Orthodox ways. You mentioned revelation that has on the one side the element of truth and we think differently about truth in our postmodern day and age than people did in the early church and the early Christianity. There was also a covenant between uh, emperor and Christianity from the fourth century onwards which uh, continued until the French Revolution and in theory continues in England till this present day, but has been undermined in the way you mentioned. But if we go to truth, before, say, 1200, there was uh, objective truth in the Western tradition. But then a guy came along with the name Abelard, and he with some others, like Ockham was responsible for the movement of nominalism, the, the, the great battle about universals. Is truth objectively present outside of us, or does it depend on our experience and on our construction? Uh, that is very similar to the existentialism we got in a secular way through uh, Sartre, Kierkegaard, in, uh, in, in some respects, too, the theological reflection of all of that in seemingly orthodox theology of Karl Barth, but without the foundation. Um, and in between, there's also Hegel, who uh, changed our definition of truth uh, from thesis and th thesis to uh, We've got a truth for this time and a truth for that time, and there's a dialectic movement, and they clash, and we get a new truth in uh, the subsequent century. So, so people are thinking differently about truth as, uh, as, as well, and look at the Bible in an existentialist way uh, of meaning assignment. It's no longer an objective truth that's revealed that the, the big thing of Christianity that there's really a God present and that despite the fall he's able to in our fallibility he's able to reveal his will and is present to to little human minds there's hardly anyone also in theology who believes that this day um how do we recognize, uh, reconnect to, to truth? And is it possible? So, of course, the first thing one should do then do is, is, is to define truth, which is a philosophical task that is probably beyond me before my third cup of coffee in the morning. But let, let me try and shift, shift the conversation a little bit um, to something that might be a bit more helpful, um, though I, I'm very happy to discuss <laughs> the influence of nominalism uh, and, and Hegel, uh, and I think I would just simply say that that most most intellectual movements, mo almost everything, contains both vice and virtue. And one of the one of the um, tasks of discernment is to distinguish between vice and virtue. I'm going to sneeze. You may need to <laughs> edit it out or keep it as a, a, a tribute to <laughs> mortality. I hope it's not the Black Death. Right. Um. So. Um, I think I, if we were having a conversation about truth today, um, I would want to say that one of the paradoxes of our society is that a society that, that was so convinced of 
the likelihood there was a God and a creator who was we could experience as rational was sufficiently courageous to embark upon the scientific revolution on, on the basis that the world around us could be relied upon to be consistent. So to some extent, uh, uh, material truth is about consistent reality that, that we contest empirically. It's extraordinary that our society has lost that confidence to the point where where, exper where, where existential criteria now mean that you can't answer what a woman is, that, that, that politics and philosophy have trumped biology. So we have degenerated very, very badly since the 16th century in terms of our our capacity to recognize truth. How would one even talk to somebody in our culture today about truth when there is no serious agreed epistemology? But I think I'd want to get around it and say that we're not so much looking for truth outside us as, as truth inside us. And I don't mean that in a solipsistic existential way. I mean that the, the truth, let's go back to Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. In what sense is he is a truth? Well, he tells us the truth about God, that God is personal, God is compassionate, God is also holy. And the, the balance between compassion and holiness uh, is a problematic balance and it's not always easy to work through. Um, but he also tells us that he will expose the truth about ourselves. And I think we've spent so much in our time in our society going around in circles trying to judge empirically the truth out there that we've forgotten that the truth about ourselves is equally important. After all, if we are the scale of the judgment, we, the scales need to be adjusted well. And what Jesus does is to show us the truth about ourselves, both philosophically, that we are contingent creatures um, who have been, who are made in God's image, we're made to be good, but we struggle with the most appalling flaws. There are a whole number of computer analogies with, with, with bad coding that help us uh, understand something of the theology, theological reality of that. But he, he changes and mends us. And so truth can be experienced in relation to Jesus as he shows us who and what we are and how he is setting about mending us. And, and that's probably one of the most important aspects of truth today, I think, because if people don't see who they really are um, and can't be mended, um, then how is it possible to act as, a, as an interpreter of truth around us? The Orthodox have a wonderful saying that the, the purpose of human life is to stand before the real God with the real self, with the mind in the heart. And, and to put that very briefly, to discover the real God is a serious task. It can only be done through Jesus. Um, the real self uh, is, this, is this contingent imago dei, child of God that we are, uh, born well but perverted and constantly suffering uh, ongoing perversion at the hands of temptation. Uh, with the mind and the heart is very interesting because it suggests that Western culture uh, has got its balance wrong. The real center of, of what it is to be human being is this, this metaphor, this image of the, the heart, obviously not the biological pump. Um, and it took me some time to realize in Christian terms that my rational faculties came second to my heart uh, and that my, my, my mind had to be captured by my heart and um, if you like, d defined by it. And that really only happens if you pray. Um, you might say that real truth is only encountered when you're on your knees in front of the living God, doing nothing except opening your heart to him. And then one of the first things that has to happen is your mind has to stop. And most people give up praying because their minds don't stop and they, they haven't uh, they haven't learned the techniques of hesychastic prayer that the East is very good with with, with the Jesus prayer, but also the West has in the Rosary. Um, hesychastic prayer, this 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 pious repetition of truth, is one of the ways in which the mind becomes calmed so that the heart can take its 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 place. But we might then say that the truth is served by this orthodox encounter of discovering the real God with the real self, with the mind captured by the heart. But we have to define truth and also talk about terms in which we want to encounter it, I think, before we, uh, in order to have a sensible conversation about it. Yes, I was also thinking about the liturgy, which in itself is also a repetition of both the devotion and truth and reminding us of those eternal realities uh, uh, that are also outsiders, 
but Jesus crown of creation, humanity uh, has that uh, image of God and uh, it all belongs together. Uh, because, yes. uh, c c it's in the Bible we find covenant thinking and that's why the innocent animals uh, fell together with us and suffered the consequences. Uh, truth, um, I'm the truth and the life, Jesus says. Uh, he's also the prehistoric uh, creator of all things. Uh, these days, um, People deny the two major means of revelation that the church has always uh, recognized. The uh, first creation, you will find that as early as uh, Tertullian, and then uh, Holy Scripture, of, uh, of course. You talked a little bit about the Gospels showing how higher criticism in general um, to turn the Bible into a religious book of uh, inspired religious people with uh, their own views, which may inspire us if we want to. And on the other hand, uh, science in general has developed a secular worldview uh, without God. And we suffer from that to such extent that it's possible to live in an age where people seriously tell us you can go to the local council and change your sex of birth. Um, there's a, a biblical prayer about Lord open uh, uh, our eyes so that we see the marvelous uh, th things of your truth. Um, yeah, so we, we should pray for that. Uh, what can we do else? To, re to re like reconnect to, 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 to that uh, uh, he, 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 he has a, that element of, of, of God's prototype, his manual, uh, the way it was intended. And we can uh, still see in creation that men are intended for women. Uh, and th th there are a lot of things that are clear biologically or socially because it's uh, causes disharmony to not do it the biblical way and there's a lot we can still read in creation if we want to but how and then scripture because uh, to take the controversial subject of women's ordination uh, i have made an inventory some years ago in research article about what my colleagues in South Africa, who I'm also associated with the university in New Testament, think about 1 Timothy 2, uh, that yes. a woman should keep silent in the congregation and uh, with the motivation of creation, plus in Paul, and uh, then the fall. And if you add Corinthians into the equation, then there's also the headship of Christ, all three non-cultural reasons. Hopefully Christ is still head of the church. And uh, we used to believe in, believe in a historical creation and fall, but uh, that's all been denied by neo-Darwinism because death and destruction were creation tools and uh, the men of the Sermon on the Mount uh, used millions of years of suffering and death and sin to create something that uh, God called very good. Uh, then you've basically lost God's revelation in creation. And if you take 1 Timothy 2, and all of my colleagues except one in New Testament and he was at my own faculty, Northwest University, said it's a black page of uh, Christendom, 1 Timothy 2. It shows us uh, really to what uh, dark depths the, the church went in the past. And of course, uh, it, it's, it's only reminiscent of how we shouldn't act in the church. 
so man basically as a judge or over scripture and denying its creator and putting it himself in the place of God. That's sort of the, the man of sin and unrighteousness of Thessalonians where we seem to have arrived. Uh, we need more prayer and uh, work, convicting work of the Holy Spirit. That's one of the reasons Jesus said he, he should come. Um, how can we retrieve our trust in, in, in God and his revelation? That it's not a nonsensical, irrational jump in uh, to, to turning, turning off your brain. Uh, but how to remain intellectually honest, serve God with all our mind? but with our heart and the things we do as well. Those three things we do as, as, as humans, how can we sanctify that for God again in our age? I think I would have answered this question differently 40 years ago when I became a Christian as to now. Um, the difficulty is the hypothetical person you propose uh, is hard to answer in, in general terms. It's, it's easier if a person comes and says, I'm having trouble with revelation. I'm having trouble with the authority of God. And then one can unwrap the thing and see what what um, uh, what, the, what the blocks in the in, in thinking are. But but in general, which is it's always difficult to answer in general, I would say that one of the one of the most effective ways of, of regaining faith is the liturgy, um, because what the liturgy does is it is it. It's an obstacle course. It's a training course. It it, uh, it reconfigures your mind and your heart to bring you to Jesus in the sacrament. It begins with praise and it moves on to a self-examination and confession. And then the moment when, when, when you've cleared the clutter, you listen to the word of God. And then in response to the word of God, there is the creed. I, I, I think the, increasingly, I think the creed is one of the most wonderful things ever written. And I'm profoundly, was profoundly moved when I watched some, orth, some Coptic Orthodox Christians after they'd had their church bombed to pieces in the middle of the liturgy and the bodies of their, their wives and their children had been cleaned away. They went out into the street and they sung the creed in defiance of Islam, which, which put the bombs in there to intimidate the people who sung the creed. The creed is the most powerful um, piece of, of, of intellectual poetry today and is absolutely essential. It is it is the creed that stands at the, at the, at the heart between the, the ravages in Islam between North and South Sudan. It's the creed that, that is at stake when the Palestinians march through the streets of our cities crying for genocide from the river to the sea. Uh, we come so, but back to the liturgy, you have the creed and then you have this extraordinary moment when when Christ gives himself. And again, I one of the powerful reasons for believing the Catholic view of the Mass is the teaching of John 5 to 8, um, where what Jesus taught was so profound and so extraordinary that people turned away in disgust. Uh, he wasn't talking about anything, any representation or zwinkelism or symbolism. Uh, it was eat my flesh, chomp gnaw on me. Um, and we received Jesus in some utterly indescribable way in the Mass. The liturgy is itself is, is if you enter the liturgy with a good heart and you want the, it carries you, and I think of, can think of no better way of encountering God um, than being present at the liturgy of the mass as, as often as possible. Uh, and then in between time, one says the office quietly in, in, in front of God. The thing about Christianity is to discover it's real, you have to practice it. You cannot discover it's real without practicing it. You can't you can't encounter it as an observer because it is not capable of being it has no traction if you like uh, if, if if one examines it as um or like, as a scientist from outside it's an organic living thing it's it's like it's like trying to understand dance without ever getting onto the dance floor with a partner you sit on the side and and but you know you wouldn't only when you put yourself in the arms of the partner does the dance begin to happen and so the dance with god has to happen through practicing it and i think probably the now now i think the most effective practice of a dance with God is, is in the liturgy of the mass. But the people you're talking about, I think, in general, who say, how can we recover? These are on a the whole, they're observers. They are people who want to set themselves up as soul judge. 
we, we are co-judges with God in the sense that God has God has delegated to us the capacity to make judgments. But it's a form of delegation. We, sh we, we share the capacity to judge only because he's given it to us. It's a participatory thing, um, not, not a, a solo exercise as uh, our society so often thinks, you know, uh, where, where everyone sets themselves up as the arbiter of truth, which in itself is such a silly thing to do. All the people who say, you know, I believe, I don't believe. Well, who, who are you? <laughs> how clever are you? How experienced are you? How well read are you? Who are you to say these things? Um, again, the, the, the extraordinary uh, hyper-individualism that we've entered into in, in, as a product of Enlightenment culture uh, is a serious difficulty. I think one of the ways in which Christianity commends itself is when one sees other Christians and you see something in them that other people don't have. That 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 light, that vivacity, that hope, that joy, that 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 that, that forgiveness, that, that purpose. Uh, again, to, to find the truth, sometimes you have to come at it by encountering an authentic Christian community. Um, so the, there are a number of ways in which we we are offered the opportunity to reconfigure ourselves. Um, but they all can only start with, with, with a crisis of some kind. I remember there was a, an Anglican bishop I knew who usefully said very often as he went round his diocese to high, in a high performing part of South London, your breakdown is God's breakthrough. As, as successful people worked themselves to the bone and then collapsed and, and were worried about their incompetence of collapsing, he would say, sometimes you have to have a breakdown before you can begin to deal with God. Because all the whole structure of self-sufficiency you hid behind has to be seen for what it is, so entirely fallible and fragile. And, and then when you've broken down, you may begin to start and allow, allow the dance to begin, which will involve God lifting you to your feet and beginning to heal you and make you better. So I think the, 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 the way in which we uh, tell people about God is partly dependent upon upon the failure of our society. As society gets worse, Christians should, in a sense, take fresh courage because the, the, the more our idiot society engages itself in discussions about whether, whether women can have penises or not, the, 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 the easier it is to say to them, you've entered Dulali land, come out. There's nothing, there's no virtue where you are. Come, come into the, the sunlit uplands of, of reality. Um, and so as society decays further and further, our capacity uh, for telling people the truth and helping them find a better way increases. Yeah, it's a bit like uh, Psalm 19, that uh, the voice in, in creation and otherwise uh, continues whether we uh, want to recognise it or not. But some yeah. of the things are so obvious that they're simply there. Uh, and you have to... Um, how does St. Paul call it in Romans that uh, uh, push the truth under uh, to, 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 to really look away, to, uh, to, to not see it? No. You mentioned the liturgy as a combination of seeking God's revealed truth, but also practically living it and uh, confessing one's sin also subjecting to the uh, uh, to God as judge and ruler of, uh, of of all men so that there's authority outside of uh, us in him in him also relationally but then I'm thinking as a um, friend of uh, several traditional uh, Roman Catholics and they will tell me that their uh, local Novus Ordo um, mess um, more or less looks like a disco and not like something uh, you described. That the priest seems to believe sweet low nothing and that the bishop might be worse. Uh, we know from the early church that the dignity of the, or the worthiness of the offers uh, does not depend on the person who fills it but but still also the liturgy has been changed since um, Vatican II uh, present day average 
native language liturgy is uh, not as respectful as uh, the traditional Anglican Mass. Uh, some of the things have uh, changed also at critical points, uh, like uh, for whom the body of Christ is given. Uh, it used to be many. Suddenly in some liturgies it's, uh, it's for all. Uh, whether you worship Pachamamas or not. Uh, could you address that? Where do you find a refuge to, to, to find that sort of uh, liturgy that allows you to draw closer? Well, I'm afraid I'm going to be provocative and say the reason I became a Catholic after becoming an Anglican was because for all the beauty of Anglican liturgy, and it's very beautiful indeed, um, Jesus was not present in the Eucharist. Uh, and the reason Jesus is not present in the Eucharist is because the Anglicans intended him not to be. That was the way, that was how they split. And then they killed in our country, they viciously killed people who wanted to celebrate the real mass in order to keep the distinction between the, the Zwinglian act of remembrance that Anglicanism uh, had put into its liturgy. So I love Anglicanism, I love the liturgy, I love its beauty, but I had to leave in the end partly because I wanted to receive, to be sure of receiving Jesus in the mass. And as you quite rightly say, the Donatist controversy and the teachings of St. Augustine um, have, have, have helped us formulate the clarity that the worthiness of the minister uh, doesn't affect the Mass itself. So the fact that you have some really defunct and incompetent Catholic bishops and priests doesn't affect the validity of Jesus in the Mass in Catholicism, which is why I go. But um, in terms of the Novus Ordo and the Latin Mass, I much prefer the Latin Mass. It's taken me the whole of my lifetime to come to a point where that's true. But there is a purpose in the Novus Ordo. Um, and the Novus Ordo um, was, part, was partly... Vat Vatican II was a very dangerous dance with the spirit of the age. Uh, and it looks as though the spirit of the age has overcome the church through Vatican II, which is a great tragedy. But the intention was to find a balance between transcendence and imminence. The, the intention was, I mean, the Latin Mass is absolutely wonderful and glorious. You're on the threshold of, of, of heaven, but it, it's, but we experience God both, both transcendentally and imminently. He's both, he's both glorious and far off and over and above us, and yet he's, he's our friend who's right beside us in the intimacy of the bathroom or the kitchen uh, or, or, or the garden, wherever we are. This is, human beings, they, are not, they, they don't find it easy to stretch their capacity to relate to God. And too many of us fall into either transcendence or imminence. Um, I, I think both the Novus Ordo and the Latin Mass uh, together uh, allow us a full encounter with God because this is something we're so bad at processing. But the, but the God of heaven and earth, the God of holiness, when we, we, confronted with whom Isaiah said, Lord, I am a man of unclean lips, and an angel comes and burns his lips to purge away the uncleanliness. That same God is the God in Jesus who comes alongside us when we are paralyzed and ask him to carry us in our arms as, as we are. And this is, this is so difficult for human beings to, to manage, to stretch our minds to the to this, that, that we fight over whether or not it should be more transcendent or more imminent. Well, it should be both, of course. Um, we should, we, there are circumstances where we should celebrate the liturgy in a way where people can crawl into a church in their beach shorts, um, uh, half drunk, and, 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 and find it accessible to them in the brokenness of their humanity, not too far off. And there are other times when they, they should approach with the greatest of care and with fasting and awe and trembling. Um, but it, it, both of these are are, are are proper interfaces of of the of, of the ministry of the church to people. Well, it's true. I think there are some there are some uh, unhelpful things in the novice auto, um, and be, but they don't stop me receiving Jesus. And and indeed, if 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 you're one of these pretentious and clever people who can see the limitations, well, then you can overcome them. <laughs> they don't they don't they don't define your capture you but precisely because you've seen their limitations so what's the problem um but equally the latin mass is not it's not for everyone everywhere how what what a huge jump it is to to get across the threshold of the church and to encounter the living god if all you have is the latin mass mm -hmm. uh, i always thought the catholic church was probably really 
um, uh, with the, 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 the armed forces with the greatest skills in our country are called the SAS, the Special Air Services. Catholicism is very, very good at, uh, uh, at making saints. And it used to be not very good at making itself accessible to the people. But now it's gone the other way around. There's too much accessibility. Um, but, but, but in the end, I think we simply have to accept that there's a scale of encounter with God. And the liturgy is, ought to be designed to allow us to find the right point on the scale so that we can enter into the presence of God and discover that who he is and who we are. Just as a, as a matter of interest, how is the ordinariate in the, the UK going? Because I that's think it's more, a, more respectful than General Norv's order, I would say. Yes, I, yes, I, I, yes I mean, the, the, I fell out with, with the ordinariate because as a condition of ordaining me to the priesthood, they wanted me to keep silence and not speak to the media. And I thought that was a dereliction of the, the charism that God had given me. So that, that that's all right. But having said we've fallen out personally, I still think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I celebrate it. I admire it. I pray for it. And uh, I, 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 I suspect it's a it's a it's a moment in time only. I I I doubt it will have the power to replicate itself. But that's a shame because it, it ought to. It is it is a wonderful combination of the best of Anglican piety and liturgy and the re rock solid reality of sacramental assurance in the Catholic Church. Uh, and, and, you know, God bless Benedict for having invented it and making it possible. And I only wish that among us, <laughs> as with so many other things, that those who have authority in the Catholic Church would see what a wonderful thing that they have in it. Touching on uh, someone who is... Uh... We could say responsible or partly responsible for uh, much of the confusion in uh, in our age. Pope Francis, if I say, tell me who your uh, friends are, and not even discuss doctrine, then I see a long queue of people either abused or covered up abuse or uh, have very strange doctrinal, uh, ethical, or um, name it and claim it in this respect. That, uh, um, it, there was a lot of vagueness over the past 10 years, but one of the things that uh, seemed to be clear is the people who were removed and promoted some of the uh, present pontificates. Could you tell us uh, more about that to give us some insight? That's very painful because <laughs> as a Catholic, one of the reasons you become a Catholic is you believe in the Pope, you believe in the Petrine ministry. It's a wonderful thing. Look look how the Catholic Church has kept together 1.4 billion people in the same church. It's, it's, mag it's magnificent the, the, and it's much down to the ideology of the, of the papacy. However, I understand Francis. I, I, in fact, I was pro Francis ideologically in the 1990s and in my liberal phase, um, at least in terms of wanting to make the church a safe and flourishing place for people who wanted to, to engage in homosexual love. Um, I, I changed my mind on that, but that's another story. But, but um, he is effectively a, a combination of a particular culture from the sort of 50s to the 80s, um, and has got stuck in it. Uh, we could argue about uh, um, the way in which he sees homosexual affection, uh, because I think that's one of the driving forces in his ideology. But the difficulty I have with him, uh, where it's very hard to, to continue to talk about him with respect, is in the ways in which he has hidden child molesters and those who've covered up for child molesters within the system. Um, when I was an Anglican and my fellow clergy fell into trouble, I went to some lengths to try and rescue the clergy. Uh, I, I spent some time as a kind of an interim person, uh, partly because I, was, I worked in a university and so I was outside the diocese and people would come to me for help. And there was a real problem about rescuing clergy in the sense that they'd got into trouble, they'd done bad things, but they were not bad people. They needed they needed helping and turning. Yeah. You know, they, they, um, 
uh, and of course, but m most importantly, their uh, their victims or their collaborators, depending on, on on what the circumstances were. But for the moment, let's just talk about the clergy um, because that's germane to the question you've asked. Uh, I understand the need to rescue clergy. I really, I really do. Better, better, to, better to rescue them than cast cast them off if if it's possible. But there's a difference between rescuing, which involves repentance and restitution and covering up. And it looks, I'm afraid, as though what Francis has done is to continue just huge cover-ups. And I'm afraid it's sick. It's sinful and it's sick. And it's dreadful to have that at the top of the church. And the problem is that the molestation above all of children is one of the most dreadful things in the whole world. It's one of the most abominable evils that there could be. And for the Catholic Church, uh, these things happen amongst human beings. They happen in all societies, in all institutions. They happen everywhere. They shouldn't. Ha they should happen least in the Catholic Church. But but so my my dog is telling me she wants she needs to go out, um, and it may be time to end the interview. But she'll make a lot of noise. She's a husky. Um, but so I, I I find that utterly it's just beyond abominable. I'm afraid and beyond defendable. Um, so the, the, the worst part about Francis is that. The next worst part is that he said he came to create a mess. At the, the youth day in 2013, I said, he, go and create a mess in the church. And through his ambiguity and his chaos, he's done that. He's said by those around him, this is hearsay, and so it's very dangerous. But he's said to be a man who relishes control and, uh, and chaos. Um, and these are both very toxic elements in the spiritual struggle uh, and he appears to me providing a platform for uh, for homosexual blessings which is which is a very serious defect in the sense that it intends to bless disorder disorder needs to be healed to become order it must it must not be blessed it's like blessing a cancer what you know you don't that's not how you deal with something that's going to destroy the, the 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 body you um so it's a very very serious misdiagnosis uh and um uh and all catholics are praying that he'll be followed by a faithful pope um and that the damage he's done may be limited and and if it's not then we are we are in such serious trouble as it's it's almost beyond my imagination to, to contemplate it. So the stakes are very, very high indeed. And, and when people say to me, well, I can't become a Catholic. I'm actually convinced now of Catholic doctrine and of, of the beauty of the, the truth of the Catholic Church and of the inadequacies of the, of the Reformation movement, which has run out of steam, but I can't become a Catholic. And I completely understand that, except that, <laughs> except that the more faithful Catholics there are, the more difficult it will be for a treacherous hierarchy to pervert the church. They must be held accountable and only faithful Catholics can do that. And so we're, we're not we're not choosing a denomination as a matter of convenience. It ought to be done as a matter of vocation. Lord, we're in a fight to the death for your church, for your, for your bride. Where would you like me to fight? Well, maybe it has to be the, the Catholic church and it has to be to fight, unfortunately, tragically, to fight, to fight the figure of Judas has taken over the Petrine ministry and brought in his abominable friends. Yes, but the, if you would be a Catholic, for instance, in an average Western country like the Netherlands, uh, uh, on paper, maybe three million Catholics in church, not more than 100,000 per month, 80-90% of them left-wing uh, liberals. Um, uh, a, a clergy that has been frowned upon since, um, basically since the days of Pope John Paul, as uh, out of touch with uh, reality and uh, May I, may I just say that two of the most impressive priests and bishops I know, Rob Mutstartz as a bishop and a friend called Father Peter Kloss, they are, they're just two of the most admirable clergy I've ever met in my life, and they're Dutch and they're Catholic. The yes. thing is that the, 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 the Catholic, Catholic Church, Christianity is dying in Europe. It stinks. 
it's it's gone bad, but it's but it's thriving in China, uh, and uh, and orthodoxy uh, is, is is growing in Russia and uh, in Russia and China and to some extent in Africa where the balance of Islam is precarious and being held. Christianity is is very powerful. In Europe, it's it stinks. <laughs> <laughs> we we we've it's not our fault. I don't, don't no way you can't attribute fault. But as it happens, we're in the dying embers of a post-Christian age, and and the people who run the churches here are are directly responsible for it. So they're they're bad. I agree. But the alternative is to sit. It's a very attractive alternative to to sit in our rooms with our Bible uh, and say our prayers. We we can do that. But um, and I'm very tempted to do that. I I was. I was infuriated in the parish I go to, where the priest spent a considerable amount of his time explaining to us how how Pope Francis was was the emblematic example of humility, because he went by public transport and and uh, he he gave up papal apartments and he didn't wear red mm -hmm. shoes and all these yeah. these. I, 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 I just... used a few million to uh, renovate the other apartments oh, no, instead. No, no. Yes. <laughs> the idea that you could sit there, having having a parish priest tell me these things without any irony. Um, so it's very difficult going to church sometimes. It is. It's extremely difficult. But you know, Jesus didn't say it would be easy. He said it would cost us everything we have. So we have to. We just have to say. I, I, I'm not. And I'm not saying everyone has to be a Catholic. I'm not even saying everyone has to go to church. Uh, it, um, I personally am a Catholic and I go to church and I would recommend it if people ask me. But what we have to do is say to the Lord, Lord, what do you, what part do you want me to play? This, this, this is the last battle. It's a, it's a, a hugely important moment in terms of my friendships and what I do and say online, in terms of how I vote, in terms of, of, of how I, I speak up for you or don't speak up for you, how I'm frightened or courageous. Lord, what do you want of me? That's all anybody can ask. And then, and then we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us and, and do what we can. And I must re respect your vocation and your discernment. And I hope and pray you'll respect mine. And together, perhaps we, we can play our own part in a renewal and the saving of Christ's body. Certainly, yes. Um, apart from uh, the, the, the liturgy and saying prayers in general, if uh, the that perhaps uh, younger or uh, for that matter, older people, whoever basically, listening uh, what spiritual disciplines could you recommend so that they can live positively in today's world and church not giving up and concentrating on the bad things uh, that, that are obviously happening but uh, look history is full of them uh, how will, how to be faithful in our generation well i would say to young people the first thing i would say is which I say to my children is don't get cancelled. <laughs> don't don't put a target on your back too early. No, no good will come of it. I mean, there may be a time when you have to walk into the amphitheater in front of the lions, but 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 put it off as long as possible. <laughs> um, so that that's that's the first thing. There's no point in giving people an easy target. Um, the snakes and the doves from the yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> Wise as serpents um, and gentle as doves. Um, my my own life has become really quite simple spiritually. Uh, it's it's to take mass whenever I can. I've discovered the rosary to be the most powerful form of prayer I've ever known. I'm not saying that polemically as a Catholic. I partly became a Catholic because in my encounters with evil, I discovered Our Lady. Our Lady had an authority that I wasn't expecting theologically or spiritually, and the authority. And I, I it's partly because I think she is the second Eve. And whereas the first Eve allowed Satan in, the, se the second Eve um, has brought us our saviour. She's, she's, she's the tabernacle that contains the priest and the bread uh, and the word. And um, it, it appears that the devil is frightened of her. And if the devil is frightened of her, then when I ask for her prayers and they work, I'm, I'm, I'm always astonished at how powerful praying the rosary is. So there's the mass, there's the rosary. I spend a great deal of time on the Lord's Prayer um, uh, because I've had to work at, at, at re-understanding it. <laughs> it, it. It takes it takes a while to re-understand it, uh, and um, uh, and um, that I could talk for a long time about that, but I won't. The Jesus Prayer is also very important, and the Psalms and the Gospels. 
So really, the, the, the rosary, the Jesus prayer, the Psalms and the Gospels and the Mass. <laughs> Do you pray the Psalms uh, through in a certain period of time? Well, I, 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 I say them the more I say the daily office. I'm not a priest anymore, but nonetheless, I've been saying the office all my life. Uh, and so I continue to say the office. And one of the great things about the office is it makes you say the Psalms. And I, I believe that the prayer is like magic in the sense that magic is like prayer. <laughs> So in the same way that magic is a, is, is a form of, of, of um, defunct spirituality with control at its centre, nonetheless, it's, it is a, a bad image of prayer. And therefore, if you like, prayer works like magic. In other words, to say out loud the words of the, of, of the Bible is to make holy magic. In the same way that magicians cast spells badly for evil, the very saying of the truth out loud, I think, has a has an effect in time and space that we can't gauge. And so, I mean, I remember reading about the time when um, uh, people were astonished with literacy and they would see people praying under their breath and, and in their heads and thinking, what, what a magnificent thing this is. You know, we all used to pray out loud. I think the primitive praying out loud is the right way ahead. I think it has to be Time and space have to re reverberate with the word of God, and it has some powerful traction that I can't measure and can't understand. But I, all I know is that when I pray, it is more powerful to pray out loud than it is to pray under my breath. It's also better for the concentration. So I think that just standing and saying the Psalms out loud in one's, in one's cell, in one's room, in one's kitchen, in one's garden, whatever, is important. Uh, so it comes out, it, th those are the elements it, it comes down to for me. The Gospels, the Psalms, the Lord's Prayer, the Rosary, the Jesus Prayer. Yes, affirming that God is and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek it. Yes. <laughs>